<laughs> weaker vessel, weaker. Nice, nice. Okay. Okay, I just need to obey uh, what I, f- I feel like the Lord wants me to read Psalm 145, and I don't really know why, but I'm going to do it. Um, so if you want to turn there, you can, but I just pray that, yeah, we'll just receive this, that the word of God is more powerful than anything we can say. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. And let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. One of the sweetest things about getting older is that you just realize how precious it is to speak of the Lord's goodness and faithfulness because you have seen it for a lot of years. Mm. And it does give you courage. Like sometimes I like almost feel guilty saying what's true and right because It's like, oh, I almost want to apologize that we have a great marriage. I want to, I don't know, like there's so many people that are struggling or hurting and I don't want to set myself, you know, up higher or something. But I also want to say, no, like one generation commends your works. Like it's okay for this word, like to say, no, there's something higher and, and more amazing. Like there's a kingdom that we're here 
operating in, waiting for. And we don't have to apologize for that. And it's okay for me to just say, you guys, you need to realize that all of this bickering or arguing and grumbling and complaining and just, it just gets you nowhere. But if you can lift up your eyes, like where does your help come from? It comes from the one who made heaven and earth. Like this is the God whom we serve. And when we, you know, set out to write this book about marriage, that's like a very humbling thing to do. Because you don't want to, like Francis pray, like we don't want to say something that isn't right or honoring. And it's, we don't want to set ourselves up like, well, we're the experts. Like we've said, that's, it's a very like holy thing to try to speak and encourage for the Lord, you know. So we sat there, we got away into this little old ranch that was like crawling with rattlesnakes. (laughs) Remember, it was a tiny bit creepy, (laughs) but it was free. And it was very sweet. Sorry if he's listening right now. And, (laughs) and, you know, he let us borrow his ranch. (laughs) But, oh, thank you. My nose is totally running. Thank you, Laura. Um, So we sat there and we're just praying together, getting away, like, Lord, what do you want us to say? And we tried to think about all the people that we had ministered to over the course of our ministry life and just couples we knew. We're like, man, there's kind of like these different categories of people, and I can't even, we were trying to remember some of them. It's like Francis coined one phrase, like there's people who are like really happy in their marriages. They're like going on vacations all the time. Like you're just seeing, they're like, oh, we're off on this this cruise or that place. And and like, they're just kind of living the dream, living in the gated community with all the things and pleasures of life and going on vacations. They're just enjoying one another. And we're like, Francis goes, it's kind of like happy, but worthless. Like... You know, which is a heavy, a heavy thing to say. But, um, but, you know, as far as like the kingdom mindset, like what, what did God want your marriage to, what, what's it for? Like it's the one expression in all of human relationships that he wants to be a picture of Christ in the church. And that's a pretty high calling. And that's pretty lofty to try to be like, wow, does our... Does our marriage make God look good? Um, Does our marriage attract people to the gospel in the way that we interact, in the way we live our lives, that we're here on mission? We're here to love the Lord our God, to love our neighbor as ourselves. So how are we serving and extending ourselves and like working together for the kingdom, you know, not for our own pleasure? And then we thought about those ones like I have said, like they're just always fighting, always bickering, always in the next trauma and always needing help and assistance. And don't get me wrong, like we all need help (laughs) and we need one another. In fact, some of you young couples, please find older couples that are really walking the walk and just Invite them into your life. Let them speak in. Like, nip it in the bud now. Be like, will you guys pray for us? Will you pray over us? Will you help us figure out how to get along? We're just being selfish, and we need you to pray for us. Um, Like, please, yes, we need one another. But there's ones that are just, that's all they're ever doing is, like, coming over and over and over again. Like, so imploded, you know? Right. Yeah, and I was I was gonna just say too, you know, we have some friends who were, you know, definitely in that category um, of uh, happy but worthless, uh, you know, for the kingdom. I mean, it's great you're having a good time, but there's people suffering, there's people dying. We got to do something, and and I, I mean, I, I was thinking today, you know, right before we came up here, I had a quick text from someone who's. Um, in Antioch, and the real Antioch, uh, you know, out in Syria, and you know where the earthquake and everything else, and just a quick update. He says, "Well, about a third of the people have left the city of Antioch. A third of the people have stayed in Antioch, and a third of the people are dead in Antioch. Like it's just 
So if we were in Antioch right now, we probably wouldn't be doing a marriage conference, right? You know, if, if we had plans, like, oh, no, we're going to have a big soccer game, that we'd probably cancel it, and well, I hope we would cancel it, you know, and go, no, let's dig through the rubble, let's, let's get food, let's do whatever we need to do, because something's going on here. And so I'm not being insensitive to like, oh, that's great that you're happy and everything. I'm just going, gosh, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. And those deaths of all these people and then everything the scriptures teach about this mission that we're supposed to be on, you know. And the thing about it is it's not like, hey, quit having fun and pursuing unity and enjoying your marriage. Go do the mission instead. I'm saying, no, it's, it's like... Our marriage, our lives, our family, it's, it's amazing. Um, at our 25-year anniversary, we're having dinner. It was like five years ago, and just and Lisa just asked me at dinner. She goes, do you know anyone happier than us, more blessed than we are? And I was like, I don't know. Um, she goes, I can't think of anyone either. I keep thinking I'll meet someone that I could genuinely say they're more blessed than we are. And I haven't found him yet. Like, it's an awesome thing to say on your 25-year anniversary. And, but the, the thing is, is it's not like we got married and we set out to let's be the happiest couple on earth. It's, it's no, let's set, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And, and then the byproduct of that was this. Seriously, because it's, it's, you can seek a united family, and, and that's good. But it's almost like the pursuit of that can almost destroy it because there's a self-centeredness in that. And just like you can seek financial security, and God's saying, no, seek my kingdom first. I'll, I'll take care of you. Um, seek my kingdom first. I'll, I'll work it out with the family. We've had crazy things. I mean, even, you know, some of you guys heard the story of my, my oldest daughter. Like, you know, ever since they're babies, you just pray for who they're going to marry. And I meet this guy, you know, and I'm blown away by his walk with the Lord to where Lisa's like, wow, you sound like you've got like a crush on him. I go, I do. He's amazing. And... <laughs> You know, I just went to prayer one day. I said, Lord, you've always given me whatever I want. I feel like whatever I ask for, and I don't, I don't want to be overstepping my bounds, but this kid, Justin, you know, could you have him meet my daughter, Rachel? And could you have them fall in love and get married? Because I want him in my family. I prayed it in February. They were married by December. Okay? And now you know, they've got a couple kids. He's one of the you know, pastors in our church. I mean, it's just, I mean, God has just been with us and amazing things. And, and, and like Lisa said, sometimes I feel bad. Like I don't want to bring it up. Because I remember giving that illustration once and then someone confronted me. And they're like, well, that didn't happen to me. So you shouldn't, you know, bring those things up. I'm like, yeah, I get it. But I also, that's pretty awesome. You know, like, like and I, I saw it in the Bible. You know, like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they're like, go to the well. Go. You know, it's just, and so I felt a peace about it. Like I really wanted this. And and I mean, and I, I kind of worked my magic too. Um, Cause he had to borrow a saw from me. I had this chop saw I want to borrow. I'm like, oh yeah, go to my house. I'm not home, you know, but uh, my daughter's home and she can get it. And so I quickly call my daughter. I'm like, Rachel, someone's coming over right now to borrow a saw. Please look your best. I said, just... Just trust me on this one. <laughs> trust me on this one. I go, just pretend you didn't try and you just got up and, you know, but do that thing when you play with your hair. Just, <laughs> but it was one of those things where it's like, gosh, Lord, you keep blessing, blessing, blessing. And now, you know, I can't tell you what it's like 
at a Friday night gathering, you know, and worshiping with the church. And one of my daughters is leading worship. You know, I got a son-in-law that's playing cajon and organized the whole ministry. I got another son-in-law, you know, who's sharing the gospel with everyone. And my wife and my daughter, my son, they're leading in work. And it's just like, wow, this is so cool. Meanwhile, okay, this one left to Africa. This one went to the Middle East. And, and it's just, it's just amazing. Um, but how much we love being together. And the crazy thing is we didn't try to. We pursued the mission and God brought a unity to the family. And, um, and I, you know, so that's why I didn't want to sound harsh, like, uh, you know, happy, but worthless. There's also the point that it's like, you know, if you really want that life to the full, it's from being on mission together mm -hmm. and thinking about more than yourself. And, and I, I want to read a passage from 1 Corinthians 7, verse 29. It says, this is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. That's a weird verse to read at a marriage conference, <laughs> right? But it's biblical. What's he saying here? The, the same Paul who said, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Here's saying the time is short. Let those who have wives live as though they had none. It's, it's saying, look, there's something bigger than just your marriage. It's not just about the two of you. And the more you just sit and stare at each other and try to work things out and just talk about how to make your life wonderful, you, you, it, you, we're not made for that type of self-centeredness. It's, it's about God's given us. We were made for a purpose. He says there were good works that were created for us to do before, one, before we were born. Isn't that crazy that, that, that you're here for a reason? I'm here for a reason. I'm here this weekend for a reason. You know, we're staying with Jimmy and Laura. I'm constantly in my mind, okay, why? Why is this? Why is this, Lord? Because your mind is fascinating. And you saw me. You knew me. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And I, yeah, Jeremiah 1 says that before I even came out of my mother's womb, that you determined certain things for me to do that I was made in there and I was gonna have experiences and I was gonna live a life and to get to this point, all of this somehow is in that fascinating eternal mind of God. And now it's like, okay, God, what's next? What's next? You know, in the same way, it's like, okay, why? Why did, why did Lisa and I get married? Why? There, it's all for some eternal purpose. And, and to try to figure that out and to walk in that and go, okay, where do we think the Holy Spirit is leading us right now? What should we be doing now? That's the life of a Christian. Um, and somehow, you know, we got so over-focused on the family that we lost sight of the mission. And I think that was one of the most encouraging things to me coming here to Antioch Church was everyone I'd meet, whether it's an usher or someone out there, I'd kind of ask their story and like, oh yeah, we spent eight years in Russia. Oh yeah, we spent nine years in Cambodia. Oh yeah, we I'm like, whoa, everyone is on mission here. And whether it's supporting or everything else. And so in some ways I'm preaching to the choir, but I, in the other ways I'm just going, man, this is where life is. Like it's, it's when you're, you're that, that's why he says in uh, 2 Timothy, uh, I think it's chapter 5, where he's talking to the rich. And uh, well, there is no 2 Timothy 5. So <laughs> it must be somewhere else. <laughs> he's talking to the rich. When did they take, is it, first Timothy? take it out? I mean... Yeah, yeah, 1 Timothy 6. Okay, for those who don't know, 1 Timothy 6 used to be 2 Timothy 5. 
<laughs> and they're like, well, first is always supposed to be bigger, so let's just move it over. And so I'm used to the old Bible. And, but in, in uh, 1 Timothy 6, uh, verse um, oh, 17, he says, as for the rich in this age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good works, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Okay, so what's the end, uh, the, the point of this? He goes, I'm telling them to do this, to be rich in good deeds, be generous with their stuff. Why? So they can take hold of that which is truly life. He came for life. I, I can't tell you how exciting it is to, to uh, like on our 20-year anniversary, um, we're like, gosh, everything that's been awesome in life is not, oh, that trip to Hawaii was awesome. No, it was fine. But those times when we did something and you saw a result, I'm like, you know, let's not go on a vacation just for us. What do we, let's go somewhere and serve. And, you know, I'm like, oh, we've been ministering to this, you know, group in Ethiopia. Let's, you know, we've been supporting them. We've never been there. Let's go. And it was just awesome. Not not because it was super fun, but it was just like, wow, I've never seen starvation like this, you know, where it's just skin and bones. And, you know, I'm praying for this little girl and they're going, no, she's not going to make it, but you can pray for her because, you know, the stomach's distended. That means the body's already eating itself and, and just getting on my knees and praying for a miracle and, and all these kids like that, that were just getting on a feeding program and, and, I can't tell you how amazing it was a few years later to find out, well, no, that girl actually made it and uh, to be running around playing hide and seek with her and laughing with her and then watching her worshiping the Lord when I just, you know, my one prayer that day was like, God, can you just keep her alive? Make this mouth worship you. I just want her to live so she can worship you. You know, and so to see kids like that and, and you just go, what compares to this? You know, or, or seeing these girls in the red light district and, and it's just the grossest place we'd ever been to. And just seeing guy after guy going into these, these little creepy, tiny little hut things about the size of, you know, just just big enough for a bed and their kids are under the bed and just guy after guy coming in for two bucks. And it's just gross just, and they're just going from stall to stall. And, and then seeing these girls rescued from that and learning jobs, you know, like getting uh, skilled, you know, in, in, in different trades and becoming hairdressers and, you know, a couple of years ago going back and, and being able to do one of their weddings, you know. I, you know, the, the thrill of, of seeing this girl come down an aisle that you know the place where she used to be and and now I'm going with her back to those places and watching her minister to everyone. And now I get the pleasure of giving her over to a man who, who is going to protect her now. And it's not a predator, a protector. And, and who loves her and loves the Lord. And, and to go, man, I, I got to play a little part in that. You know, to, to chase a girl around, you know, playing hide and seek and, and then watching her worship. I'm like, gosh, we played a little part in that. You know, to just see hospitals build and go, whoa, we, we, we did. Uh, look at this place. This is crazy. That was an empty piece of land. Look at this, a, a full hospital. Like, these are the things where you're going, oh my gosh, I live the greatest life on earth. We live the greatest life on earth. I mean, it just doesn't compare. 
meanwhile, we've all purchased things and bought things that we're disappointed in. And in your mind, you, I, I go, oh my gosh, that would have fed and kept alive a thousand people. But I was stupid and I just thought about me and I bought that and it didn't even work out. It, you know, it's, it's just, I'm talking about a life that is full. I'm talking about taking a hold of life that is truly life. I'm talking about being 30 years into marriage and go, I think we're the happiest people on the planet. And, and God listens to us. And I, I think of, um, I, I love that verse in Isaiah 58 when he says, uh, sorry, whoever does PowerPoint, I'm just all over the place, going places where I told you I would not go. Um, but when he's talking about fasting and, uh, you know, when he says, I'm not listening to you, God says, is that the fast that I called you to do? You know, just act all sad and everything. Um, in verse seven, he says, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? He says, then shall your light break forth like the dawn. Your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. Like, what is better? Okay, you want to talk about life that's truly life. What is better than being a person that prays to God and God goes, here I am. Okay, there's, you can have anything on the earth. What would you want more than that? To know God and to, for him to say, I'll be your rear guard. I've got your back. God Almighty sitting on his throne. And when you call out to me, I'll say, here I am. What do you need? Oh, it's Francis. He cares for the poor. He pours out his it's just, this is the life. And, and so when we talk about mission, it's just like the fear of the Lord. I'm going, that is a treasure. It's a good thing. It's a great thing. And so when we go, man, don't just live your life for yourselves. Live for eternity. Live for the kingdom. Care for the poor. Use your resources for the poor. Because God says, when you do that, then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. There's something about fighting for those who are poor. Um, we've been blessed in this country with a ton of resource. Um, and some of you guys, well, I'm not rich. You're rich. Um, there are people that would literally cut their arms off to have access to your trash can. Um, just, it, we live in a crazy world. And there is so much need out there, so much desperation. And so for us to do a marriage conference just for the sake of marriage... Does, isn't biblical. Mm -hmm. It's very important that I love Lisa like Christ loves the church. It's very important that she comes under my leadership like the church comes under the leadership of Christ. Mm -hmm. It's very important that there is a love and a mutual humility. Um, and we, of course, want the, the family to be united, just like we want the church family to be united. Um, but if we just chase those things and not the mission of God, we miss out and we're being disobedient. We seek first the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we're here for a reason. And, and it's so fun to, to realize I was made for something. You know, that, that, that Jeremiah 1 passage just got me so excited years ago to think, I'm not an accident. He says, he knew me before he even formed me in my mother's womb. You know? And me, I don't know how many of you are in the same boat, but I was an unwanted child. 
You know, I, my mother died giving birth to me, so my dad gave me up for adoption, and he just didn't want me. No one wanted me. I was that accident. And God says, no, no, not a chance. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. And I just thought, wow, God, you knew. You, know, you knew my mom was going to die, but you wanted me on the earth because there's something I was going to do. And maybe one of the biggest things was just motivate one person in this room to, you know, to think about their purpose on earth. Or maybe for many of you, like, I don't, I don't know what it's all about, but it's so great to go, I was designed for this and no one else is going to do this. I have a calling. We have a purpose. And that's what I think has made our, our, our marriage so, and our whole family just so, so rich and full. And then our kids now, you, you know, once they grow up, because you can fool the little ones. They believe anything. <laughs> oh, mom and dad are happily married, you know. Um, but they're going to get to an age where they start thinking back and go, oh, that's why this that's why that we all figured out our parents you know we all figured them out to some degree later on in life and so what's we really think we're going to fool our kids forever mm -hmm. they see when mom and dad actually sacrifice and they see like whoa we had a lot of money and they spent it on that well what is that is it hospitals? Is it schools? Is it church planter? You, you know, they, they know and they'll see and they'll figure it out. And so that's where, I mean, as much as I, 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 I get it, like, yes, have Bible study with your family, do the devotions, everything else. But more important than all of that is you've got to be real. They're going to know whether you love God or not and whether you were the real thing or not, and whether you loved each other or not. Mm -hmm. They see it. We, we know when people are in love. We just do. You know when someone's infatuated with their kid. And you know when someone is really into their marriage. And you know when someone is really into God himself and has a deep love for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we started where we started. And it's like, it has to be about you knowing him. And all this is the outflowing of the Holy Spirit in you. And, and that's why even at this point, I know that we're heading towards the end here, but man, if for any of you, you're, you're hearing some of this stuff and, and, and it's still like external, you know, it's not coming from inside. Okay, that's what the Spirit does because what happens a lot of times in church is what a Second Peter 2, I think it's 22. Um, I know, you guys can't trust me anymore, but it's, it, it's in there um, where he talks about a, the, the, the dog that returns to its vomit. And he talks about a pig, how you can wash him off, but he goes right back to the mud. And he just talks about what a horrible thing that is. And, and I'd hate for this to be like an external washing of pigs, mm. okay? Where, where you come in here, there's nothing going on inside. And your marriage is a mess and your life is a mess. And so you, you, you hear a few external tips you can do. And you get kind of washed clean and you do some um, interaction with each other. But you know what? Eventually you'll run back to the mud. Why does a pig go back to the mud after you've washed him off? Because he's a pig. His nature didn't change. You see, that's what God has to offer. That's why we keep going back to the Lord. I mean, he can change your nature. He can make it to where suddenly you're stepping in mud because that's the old you. But when you get in there, you're like, I don't like this like I used to. I don't like the feeling of dirt. I used to be okay doing this. And now it's like, ugh, that's gross. And, and it keeps going further and further and further. You know, some of us older ones will, will maybe watch a movie like we watched 20 or 30 years ago. 
And it's so offensive to us now. We're like, whoa, that movie was horrible. How did, I got, turn it off. Don't let the kids watch that. But somehow it was like, I don't know. I was okay with it back then. I thought it was clean. You know, it's, it's like the sanctification. Why? Because something happened in you that changes you, where you become more like Christ. You really do. You start taking on his humility. That's why you laugh at Like, gosh, remember when we used to get angry at this? Remember this? You know, and sure, every once in a while, a, a word will slip out of your mouth. But, you, you know, it was only once. But uh, it, it's just, it's still... It's, it's just like the sanctification process. You know what I mean? And that's why we, I keep praying. I keep praying. And it's not a formality thing. It's not a way to end our sermon or begin a sermon. It's like, no, God, there's part of me that just wants to pray the whole time because either something supernatural happens, like we said about our daughter. It's like the Spirit of God came into her. And it was like, whoa, she's acting very different. But as parents, we're like, well, let's give it a week. You know, and then a week passes, it's like, whoa, okay, a couple more weeks, a month, six months, a year, like, okay, there is absolutely no other explanation that the Holy Spirit of God finally took a hold of her heart, and she's no longer a pig. There's a, a change of nature. It's not a rushing back, and... Just hearing testimony after testimony of people who have changed, I think about, you know, Lisa's uh, hairdresser. Doesn't her hair look good? But um, Thank you. it does. Uh, actually, it was her older hairdresser, you know, tells a story about she and her husband, and, you know, they were married, and he was, became just like super alcoholic, abusive where she'd come into work. She was a hairdresser. He was a mechanic. She'd come with black eye, broken ribs, like that type of abuse, big time. And she would talk about how she's like, gosh, the Bible says I can't divorce him, you know, and, and you know, maybe I can get away, maybe this or that, but just depended on the word of God. And, but she said, my prayers were, God, you see what's going on, and I know I can't divorce him. But she goes, I literally would just pray, God, would you please kill him? She goes, I, you see what abuse your daughter is going through. And I know exactly the road that he's on right now. Would you have him go off the edge? Would you just end it? And just these, these, these crazy. And then what happened that day? You remember the story more like where? Well, I'll with the leg. mess it up. Yeah. But basically he was coming in from a drunken night and she knew that he was coming for her. Um, but I don't remember if she prayed right in that moment, but all of a sudden there was a snap and his leg just broke like the largest bone up here. And he ends up having to go to the hospital uh, and was just, yeah, completely transformed. I don't, we're leaving a lot of details out. Yeah. I don't remember it. Their yeah. story is amazing. They were but, married when she was only 16 years old and now they have been married for. They're in their 60s. Six, no, they're set. She's 70. Wow. Yeah. So they've been married how long? Almost what is the 50 math? Years. 50, four years. <laughs> no, but they are one of the few examples in our lives of a older couple who absolutely love the Lord, have taken in so many foster kids through their lifetime and, and adopted them. In fact, when they were 60, in their 60s, they adopted 10 children at once. So they just kept going. And so you just see this line of bikes, you know, and she's explaining to her kids, look, I don't know if I'll live long enough till you guys graduate. But let me tell you, I mean, you talk about living for the kingdom because she, they were the ones that confronted me one day. They're like, well, I, I know you think we're radical, but what, what do you do with James? 
You know, what do you do with true religion being to care for the widows and the orphans? And, and we take that literally. And so, I, I mean, here's a couple who was obviously an absolute mess, married at 16, abusive, and praying for death of the other one, and then God redeeming it, and, and, and having a mission together. And now the way they talk about one another, like she just like she just tell me, she goes, Pastor, there's no godlier man than my husband. No one who is I don't know anyone on earth like him. And it, you know so I, I say that to just give you hope. One, that you were made for something. And that when that spirit comes into you and changes your nature, and then you start pursuing the mission together, you can have those 50-something years of just a crazy, eternally focused, mission-centered lifestyle. And they're so, I don't know, there's just such a peace about them. I mean, they're exhausted. They're, you know, obviously... Um, and have gone through so much tragedy because any of you that have adopted children out of the foster system, it, it never goes perfectly and often ends up in a nightmare. But you just have the peace of I did everything I could. And it's heartbreaking. It's not like, oh, this glorious story and all 10 of the kids became pastors. No, it, it's, uh, it's just messy. Um, but... They will tell you there's nothing she, else. I, uh, I, her texts are always my favorite because it always includes her love for Christ and exhortation like, Lisa, let's finish strong. I just want to like crawl up to the throne of God at the end, just use up all my energy and just be like, here I am, Jesus. I poured it all out for you. Mm. you know. And so it's like she just always carries that visual. Like I just want to just like crawl my way towards the throne at the end of my life. And I'm like, wow, how amazing to have people like that mm. speaking in to our life, you know, and how amazing that she prays for us. Mm. Um, so grateful for them. Yeah, they're like the most encouraging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, for a non-spiritual example or uh, illustration, that's the word. I was thinking of his Mario Kart and now I have one. But have you guys ever watched The Amazing Race? Um, I don't know if it's very popular anymore. It might just be old. But I kind of got hooked on it with one of my daughters. And uh, after watching a couple of seasons, I'm like, this is really interesting. I'm always looking for, like, biblical parallels. I'm totally that mother. <laughs> Where, like, on our humility talk, this is going to sound really crazy, but I literally was thinking of the movie Cinderella the like live action version, if you haven't seen it, it is a precious example of humility. I was like, Cinderella acts so much like Jesus, I can't even stand it. And at the end of the movie, when she looks at the, has anybody watched it? Please, okay, thank you. At the end when she looks up, well maybe I shouldn't say this, but you're probably not gonna watch it. Um, but watch it, if, for those of you who have young children, watch this movie with them. Talk about it. Like, let's have these conversations now with our children to say, look, always point out humility when you see it. I always try to do that. Look at that. Do you see that humility? I don't care if it's a cartoon or someone at the market. I want my kids to have an eye for humility. Like, look how that person comes under and just wants to love someone. And her example is amazing under such cruel treatment and she just remains faithful and gentle and quiet and loving and at the end she looks at the stepmother and you're just wanting you want her to say something like I hate you but what she says is I forgive you and it's only a movie but it makes me cry <laughs> because I'm like that's powerful that's so powerful because when we forgive like that heart so it's like yes point this out okay yeah. but to the amazing oh, race yes. go ahead and I would say, just ignore all the magic and witchcraft in it. No, there wasn't. Oh, there is the fairy godmother. Oh, yeah, right. I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's a parallel. I'm just sensitive to mud, you know? It's like, <laughs> oh. It's true. It's true. 
it's hard to kind of say like, think of the Lord when you think of the fairy godmother because you really don't want to, yes. yes, but there is a parallel there. Just Anyways, okay. Clarify. <laughs> Every worldly example breaks down somehow. Yes. But right. in The Amazing Race, there are 12 couples, and they start in, like, Waco, Texas, but then they go all around the world. They're in India, they're in China, they're in Thailand. Um, at every stop, they have roadblocks. There are tasks they have to complete. It's like we rip it open. Which one's going to do it? You're going to do it, I'm going to do it. It's teams of two. It's brothers and sisters. It's husbands and wives. It's best friends. It's moms and daughters. Um, but after we've watched it a couple seasons, I'm like, wow, this is such an amazing, like, parallel to the scriptures, like in 1 Corinthians 9, when it's like, don't you know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize, right? At the end, it's only one team that's going to win the million dollars. The first team that can make it through all these challenges, all these, there's so much pressure, right? And it's, we got to... Let's say we get to like our next stop, which is Thailand, and we complete all of our tasks, but whoever comes in last is eliminated, right? So it's like slowly you're getting down to where there's only two teams left running for the, the finish line. Now, thankfully, the Lord has said, all who call on my name are welcome to come to the finish line. We're all running this race. But the picture is so beautiful because it's always the couple's that are honoring to one another, loving, working together, like our goal, don't forget our goal. Our goal is the end. Like, okay, we can celebrate for a minute. High fives, hug, we got here first, but now we gotta get ready. Tomorrow we, we go again. It's another leg of the race. We've gotta keep going, right? So it's like, that's the mindset we have to have in our marriages. Like, okay, we can celebrate. We got to five years of marriage. Okay, awesome, high five. Now, what's next? Let's keep going, you know? It, it's like still at 30 years, we're like, Okay, high five. Well, we're almost at 30. But um, man, like, no, it's the, it's the end. It's I want to receive the crown of life. I want the imperishable wreath that the Lord's going to give. Like, you know, all those runners want to just the perishable. Oh, well, look at me. I won the medal, the mm -hmm. wreath. And we're like, oh, man, we, we want to receive that crown. And then we want to throw it at the feet of Jesus because we're still so, like, we can't believe he's welcoming us into this amazing kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just hope that you will grasp some of that <laughs> mindset like yeah this is a race and we're we're meant like philippians 2 or 1 when it says 27 starting in 27 only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of christ so that whether i come see you or am absent i may hear of you like this is what Francis and I would want to feel as we walk away, like, hey, you guys, just let your manner of life be worthy of the calling you have received. Like, let's not forget about the kingdom. And then whether we come and see you again or we're just absent and we're over in the Bay Area doing the same thing, you know, we can hear that you're standing firm in the gospel. We want these marriages. We want to know that you're standing firm in the gospel, striving with one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents this is a clear sign to them of their destruction but of your salvation and that from god um, in chapter two he goes on if there's any encouragement in christ any comfort from love any participation in the spirit any affection and sympathy complete my joy by being of the same mind having the same love being in full accord and of one mind do you do you get the language here it's like you guys, we need to be of one mind. It's one spirit, one faith, one baptism, one Lord, one God and Father of all. So hmm. I want to take a minute, though, and just say, I don't know for somebody who's listening or somebody who's here where your heart is like crushed and grieving because you're thinking, I am married to someone who does not want the Lord in this way. And that is not God's design. And I'm sorry God does want you to strive side by side for the gospel. He wants you to be of the same mind. But if you are in that place where it's like, man, I am going after the Lord, but my husband or my wife just doesn't want it. I'm, I'm just here to encourage you, like, hold fast. Hold, don't swerve. Like, hold unswervingly to that faith you profess. And believe and know that you can fully honor God as a husband or as a wife 
who is fully committed without the spouse that is by your side, but you can still bring glory and honor in your love for God and in your love for your spouse, even while you're waiting for their salvation, while you are praying and like, like begging the Lord that they would come to know Christ. And for you wives, you're like, man, I would love to have a leader but if he's not, just pray for him and believe that God is at work and that God can use you even without a word. Remember from 1 Peter 3? He can be won over without a word. Like press on, keep going, run your race because the Lord is fully ready to accept you at the end, whether or not your spouse is right there beside you. That's what we want. But he's like, honey, I got you. Keep coming, you know, because... The crown is for you, and so it's, it's okay. You know, I was, I was just thinking about, I mean, I guess it was last night when we first got here. We were a little surprised in some ways. Usually when we do marriage conference, all like 20-year-olds, you know, um, that are just trying to figure out how to get going. And um, some of you don't look 20. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, we told you know, Jimmy and Laura, we're like, wow, there's a real mix. I and mean, there's a lot of older couples in there. And so it's, it's different. And, and I'm like, okay, what, again, Lord, what are you saying by this? And especially hearing a message and hearing about our friends in their 70s and they're just charging it. And I, I, I think there's something that is, well, I know there's something sovereign in this. Because I know there's a young crowd. I mean, when I think of Antioch, it's usually when I'm at World uh, Mandate and I'm, you know, I'm running into young people around the world that are, are from here and young couples and this and that. And, but what I hear so much is how badly they, they want examples. Um, just, and I think that's a large reason why you're here, some of you, that maybe... I get it. You just get tired after a while. And you want to look back and go, well, we had our time. And it's just, that's not what it's about. Um, it's about this next generation. And there is a truth. Well, Jimmy and I talk about that. We're not the ones that are going to go out and pioneer and do all this stuff. But it's, it's very important that we walk alongside of these younger couples and encourage their faith and show them that we're still living by faith and we're still thinking about eternity. We're not just trying to stay alive. We're not just trying to survive. Seriously, I feel like so many old people, that's all it is, is let's see how long we can live, honey. It's like, who cares how long you live? It's like, what did you do? You made it to 100 doing nothing? Wow, that's great. And you didn't help anyone? Oh, but you were healthy. It, it's just like we don't need that. And it's just like, honestly, I meet older people still, and, 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 and I'm like, wow, you're still buying stuff? Like you can't even really enjoy that. Like it's time to start unloading, you know, because... We're coming to the end. Seriously, I, I, I look and I go, I think this will be my last suit that I'll ever, you know, like, like a few years ago, I bought a suit, you know, because one lasted like, I don't know, since we were married and for 99 bucks and this one was like 129. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I want to stay to where I can fit in this and bury me in this, you know, whatever. <laughs> You just, I just start thinking. I'm not going to think, ooh, next year I want to look even better. It's like, it's done. I'm on the other side. And now it's like I'm getting closer and closer to seeing his face. And so this is the worst time to take it easy and forget. I mean, what are you really going to enjoy anyways? It's just, it's just not, nothing is as fun anyways. And so... Let's just keep investing for the kingdom. That's the stuff that fills us up. Start figuring out how do I unload what I have, but to accumulate or whatever else. So I believe there's something in this multi-generational, which I praise God for this. This is not just a bunch of 20-somethings saying, you know, Francis and Lisa teach us, but there's just this mixture 
of older couples that are saying, God's not done with us. We have something to do here on this earth, not just survive, not just play with the grandkids, but there's some sort of example we need to be for them. And that gets me excited because this is what we haven't had um, as long as I've been alive. There hasn't been a good baton passing. Mm. You know, there hasn't been a coaching. There hasn't been, uh, in in Numbers chapter 8, it talks about the Levites retiring at 50. And, uh, and, And they're no longer allowed to serve in the temple, but they're supposed to, you know, guard these 25 year olds that are that are now entering into that service like with our energy it's to be used to invest in that next generation and because if they're left to themselves man they're going to make all these mistakes that they don't have to make and we can keep them from some of the pitfalls that we've gone through but to just check out and just retire or whatever that can't be an option for us the desire is for the kingdom and for the light to keep going and uh i think that's kind of the phase that we're in you know jimmy and laura lisa and i are just we're 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 working we're thinking we're hanging out you know the house going okay how do we encourage this next generation because there's some amazing people but they need us not to lord it over them and control everything and even be in charge mm-hmm. i mean one of the greatest things that happened to me was uh when we were first married and i felt like god was calling me to start a church and i was 26 years old married for a few weeks and i remember finding the oldest guy i knew and he was 56 and uh and he was an elder at a church i'm like man what do you this is crazy and i remember him telling me he goes, Francis, if you start a church, I would go with you. And I would follow you anywhere you go. I'm like, what? And not to control me, not to lead me, whatever. He goes, no, I see something in you. This isn't a job to you. And, and sure enough, I mean, without his support, I don't know if I ever would have started that church. I don't know where I'd be. And he was able to walk alongside of me. And now I'm going, wow, I'm that 55-year-old guy now. And I want to be that guy that's like looking for that 20-something or that group of 20-somethings and go, I want to be that older guy. I don't want to control this because he let me go Mm -hmm. and believed in me and and pushed me and and told me no you've got gifts quit saying you're just a preacher you've got more i know it in you and he that encouragement and it's huge in my life and to think that some of us can be that not thinking about ourselves is not to get glory for ourselves no one knows who ron wilson is you know but i'm telling you he was the one that came alongside of me and and did all of that and i wouldn't be here today without him And, man, you have that opportunity. And even if you've failed, even if you've wasted a lot of your life, to now go, you know what? I I realize I've not been about the mission to apologize to your kids and go, you know what? I screwed up. I kind of listened to all this other stuff. I was selfish or whatever. But, man, mom and dad have talked, and we came to this gathering, and we're like, you know what? We've got some years left. We've got some years left, okay? We're not going to sit here and wallow in what we didn't do and how we failed. That's what Satan wants us to do. It's to go, man, we can still think. We can still kind of walk. We, you know, let's, <laughs> let's, uh, let's do everything we can uh, for this next generation because I, it's a very special time we live in. I am thrilled to be alive in this season. Like if you look at the whole generation of the whole world, people go, oh, I wish I lived in Jesus and disciples time. I wish I lived with Moses and, you know, seen this, 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 this. I'm going, no, I, 
I, genu- I, I mean this. Like, when you look at biblical prophecy and everything that's happening, and I don't have time to get into all of it, I'm like, this is all happening in our lifetime. The gospel is getting to every nation. In our- this has never happened. The word of God is being translated into every language. Like, during our lifetime, this has never happened. The church and Israel are in existence again together. This isn't, hasn't happened in 1900 years. Like, this is a crazy season. And maybe while the world is in so much turmoil, you're just going, this is it, this is it. And we're alive to see this? Like these promises? Uh, uh, Could Christ be coming back in our lifetime? Like this is the culmination of everything. And there's a reason. And I'm excited. I don't know how much longer I have on this earth, but I'm thrilled to be here. And I'm thrilled to know this God and have peace with this God and be on a mission and know that there's still a purpose. And uh, please, please Mm -hmm. walk away from here knowing that there's something that he's calling you to do. And then the more you guys stare at it, the mission and pursue it, that's what's going to bring the unity. Um, There'll be a lot of Places you can go to get self-help things, to communicate better or whatever else. I'm just telling you, there's something about the mission that can't be replaced. Um, it's just the way God designed us. Mm-hmm. I mean, even even on a sports team. I, I'm a Laker fan, being from California, sorry. But um, I just, I still, I always picture that one scene after a, the, the Lakers won years ago where Kobe jumps into Shaq's arms and, and it's like, whoa, you know, and, and it, it just, the team, just the celebration. Why? Because they were focused on a goal. They made it. Okay. But then what happened afterwards? They start bickering with each other. No, it's my team. No, it's the Diesel's team. And, they, and, and meanwhile, we're all looking on like, you idiots, come on. Get over your issues. There's a championship to be won. And I think that's the way I feel in the church sometimes. It's like, okay, okay, yes, she's miserable. Yeah, okay, he's horrible. What a, you guys, would you just quit fighting because people are dying. There are people that are digging up rubble right now, looking for their kids, and, and you want to fight about this. There's just a little bit of just, just stop it. You know, like, like there's something bigger going on, and it's this mission. And if you would focus on that and realize this amazing season that we're in, there's a natural, you know, jumping into each other's arms, celebrating these victories in ministry, and also a running into each other's arms because of the discouragement that goes on in the ministry and the disappointment. But all the while, I had no clue the unity that was being built in our family because we were just focused on the ministry. And then you're looking around going, man, we're crazy about each other. Um, you know, we're FaceTiming our kids overseas. We're constant. I mean, you know, family group chats, just like, and just every week trying to get together as much as we can, you know, if everyone's in town, it's just, but that didn't happen by trying to be this happy United family. It's about genuinely being excited that we have a mission on this earth. We have a calling on this earth. And when we do that, his word is true. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be given to you. Mm-hmm. It's like it was just handed to us. Oh, you want him for a husband for your daughter? You can have him. It's just call out to me and I'll say, here I am. So I would love to, I want to pray for the mission that each of you, maybe you came in here just trying to work things out, but I want to pray that God gives you an outward focus together that you go, okay, what is next for us, you know, and that God would give you direction. I Honestly, I don't know what question, conversation you guys have written, but I would like that. I'd like to pray for that, that God would give you, as you talk, a vision for a future ministry together, that, that you spend some time talking about why are we still on earth? 
Why are we together? Why do we have this skill set or these resources? And to pray and go, God, show us. And I want to pray over you right now. In fact, uh, just receive this. Lord, you promise that if we ask for wisdom, you would give it. You would give it to us. But if we doubt, we won't receive anything. So, God, I believe from heaven right now you hear me on your throne and that you are going to give wisdom all around this room. Mm -hmm. Wisdom on how do we live the rest of our lives? What decisions do we make? How do we invest our time, our money, mm -hmm. our energy? God, mm -hmm. grant wisdom. You want to grant wisdom. Please just give it all around the room right now. Mm -hmm. Visions of how you're going to use these couples for your glory. Visions of young couples they can pour into. We believe this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name, amen.